uh, this foundation that they created for us, uh, the ideas of Pan-Africanism, the ideas of, of liberation for people of African descent, and that Pan-Africanism was the idea about how to get to that liberation. So the, the Nkrumah was the first president uh, after the independence of Ghana in 1957. And so in, in Nkrumah, uh, you know, many of the places in Africa were plagued by colonialism. So uh, the Portuguese, uh, the Germans, the, uh, the French, the British, all had their, their, their fingers in different places on the continent. And when you look at those fingers that they had on the continent, uh, that was also part of the, that was kind of like the next iteration after their ideas of migrating around the world to other places. So that in the Americas and in the, the South and, and, and North America and Central America, uh, to Australia, all the other places, uh, India, where they colonized, right? Who's ever heard of the idea that the sun never set on the British Empire? Right. So what does that mean? What does it mean to say the sun never set on the British Empire? Yes, sir. Exactly. So they had colonies everywhere. They were running and controlling things all over the con all over the, the globe. And their imposition, right? Their their impact. Their their they, they were imposing themselves on all the other peoples of the world. Now, India got independence. I believe it was in 1947. Ghana in 1957. Right. So, with all these places around the world, uh, Europe Europe had its tentacles. And so British, the British had the, the greatest number of tentacles. And their tentacles were the things that enabled them to control what was going on around the world. So the sun never set on the British Empire meant that the, the British Empire, right, we had to listen to the words, the empire, they had an empire, they were in, into empire building. And so they wanted to control the commerce and things that happened all around the world. And that's what they did. And they ultimately, that was became uh, impossible to maintain. And so then they had lots of pushback from the people whom they invaded. Um, so that's a little bit of it. You know, these are classes we could do, uh, lots of classes we could do. Uh, but the question about Pan-Africanism. So Pan-Africanism is this idea, uh, and I think I'm gonna, I don't want to take too much of what you're talking about. So if you want me to leave that for you, then I'll do that, or you want me to say anything about it now. OK, so, so the idea about Pan-Africanism is that the idea that we want to have uh, African people, uh, that we have similar ideas and cultural foundations and the connections they're in, we want to be able to, to talk about and bring together, to use the power and the resources of African people together. And so Pan-Africanism is the idea of that there needs to be a unified Africa. So it builds on the ideas uh, that Garvey set in place. It builds on the ideas of W.E.B. Du Bois. It builds on the ideas of Henry Sylvester Williams. It builds on the ideas of all these folks who were working on it. Even before that, there was something called a pan-Negro movement. Right? So all of these various movements that were the foundation of this idea that came up later during the independence struggle uh, of African people, that this independence struggle that happened later on was really the place where we had the, the later movement about pan-Africanism. So pan-Africanism is an outgrowth of an earlier idea about it. Garvey didn't use the word pan-Africanism, but he was a pan-Africanist nonetheless, right? And so then you still see that some people had different words they might have used in the process, but their actions and ideas lended themselves to the same type of struggle. So those are the things that we want to focus on. And you'll see that in South Africa, right, they had ideas about the ANC or the PAC. The ANC was the African National Congress. The PAC was the Pan-African National Congress. And so then they're pushing that agenda again today. Right, I'm, I'm, a, 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 I'm the New Jersey rep for WADU, which is the World African Diaspora Union. And we work uh, collectively with uh, the African Union, which used to be the OAU, the Organization of African Union. Uh, but the, the AU, the African Union, is a body that is talking about how do African countries uh, work together? What are the best ways for commerce and for military and for other types of uh, education? They have these Pan-African universities now uh, that are starting to, to emerge. And so then these ways are ways in which Africans can work together collectively without conflict to bring about change in the world uh, from an African perspective. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank okay, you. Good. Um, so that this day that we have, uh, it started off by a, a friend, a mentor of mine, who I, I worked with for many years back in my days at the University of California, whose name was uh, Dr. Zizwe Poe. 
He is a professor at Lincoln University, nonetheless, right? Right. Uh, right in the heart where my man Kuma went. Um, and so uh, Dr. Poe came to ECC, I think it was five or six years ago now. I have to look and see which number this is. I think it's the sixth annual. And uh, when he, had, he had written a book on Nkrumah and Nkrumahism. And so that sparked my interest of thinking that we need to do something to celebrate the ideas and to reflect on the ideas and foundations of Nkrumah and Nkrumahism. How do we build upon the work of those Pan-Africanists who provided the foundation for the things that, we're, we are, that have emerged for us today? How do we continue the struggle and continue the, the political dialogue? How do we continue the, the educational discourse uh, that they started? And so one of those ways that we can do that is that we can have these types of forums that allow us to discuss the things. So I want this to also be a, a, a platform for us to, to have discussions. We also had Dr. Leonard Jeffries come one year. His wife came one year. Uh, um, and we had, um, last year, we had the, uh, the former president of, the, the president of Burkina Faso, uh, his brother came. Uh, his, his name was um, Thomas Sankara, right? Thomas Sankara's brother was here. And he came and he gave us a great uh, understanding of the struggles of Thomas Sankara. And I'll just give, put that in, in context, and then I'm going to turn it over to our, our keynote speaker for today. So that uh, Thomas Sankara uh, was someone who uh, pushed the envelope on the ideas of how to have uh, a, an independent and, and a, a, an evolving African experience, how to have an African experience that included not only uh, receiving money and, and from the West, but how do you engender a, an idea, a, a methodology for developing African uh, genius. Right, for developing African uh, commerce, for developing African manufacturing, for developing African educational experiences and, and, and ideas. So he would have, he as a president said that we have to manufacture our own things. We want to take the raw materials and we don't want to export them to Europe. We don't want to export them to China. We don't want to export them to the United States. We want to produce them here. We want to produce our own clothes and wear them. So he compelled his, his governmental uh, folks in office to wear uh, African clothes that were made in Burkina Faso. Uh, and so that's a way, one way to think about some of the things that, that, that even folks here had used in their thinking, right? So if you look at a Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was their idea, to recycle those dollars in the community so that they, they, they could use that as a foundation of building wealth. That's one of the challenges we have for wealth in the community today is that before money gets into our hands, it's already leaving the community. How do we reinstitute that type of thinking? And that's why we had Sankara's brother come here to give some insight onto ways in which we can do those things. We also had uh, a, a great scholar, uh, Horace Campbell. And Horace Campbell came and gave a, a great erudition on Garveyism. And I think that those are some of the things we need to look at. So you know, those are online to look at. You can look at them until you get some, some understanding of some of the things that have gone on. And then that provides a foundation for you to make the connections between what we do today. Um, and so as we go into today's lecture, uh, I, 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 I'm going to suggest to you that it's going to be a, a slightly different uh, than maybe some of the past ones, but I, I, the person who's here today for, is, is, is such a, uh, a powerful, uh, thoughtful person in his way of understanding history. Uh, Brother Laren Lawrence Ham, uh, he's the chairman for the People's Organization for Progress. He also was a longtime worker here in the, in the city of, of Newark. Uh, he was the youngest school board person on the official school board in the United States. Yes, in the United States. Um, and you know, when you think about that, that means that he was someone who was responsible for hiring and firing the superintendent at 16. <coughs> Hire, make, yeah, that's right. Because he is someone who has, has been in the struggle. He's been an understudy of somebody by the name of Amir Baraka. Uh, he's been an, uh, uh, someone who has uh, found ways to draw the connections for the histories of people of African descent in the United States, and particularly in this area, in ways that I would su suggest to you that there's nobody else who has the 
knows the, the dates, the facts, the times, the places, the way Larry Ham does. He's able to draw those connections in ways that are, are powerful and meaningful <coughs> because it, I want you to think about what are the contributions that you hope to make? And how long do you plan to make those contributions? And if you want to see someone who's made and making those contributions, I want to present someone to you who has stood the test of time, right? who has been working in the eyes of those who came before him in a way that, that, that takes that vision to the next level. And as students, that's your goal. That's your responsibility is to see how, if you have mentors who are your professors, if you have mentors who are other places in your life, or uh, uh, organizations, clubs, your, your, your uh, uh, religious church, your masjid, how do I become the one who is going to take the mantle? We're not going to be here for other, forever. How do I become the one uh, uh, who is going to be, see, many of you want this part, be in the limelight. That's what you want, and that's the unfortunate side of it. Because it's not about being in the limelight, it's about doing the work. And I present to you somebody who's been doing the work consistently. And if you don't even understand it, I've never seen it, all you have to do is step outside to the other side of the street some days, and he'll be right there <laughs> in front of the Lincoln, the Lincoln statue on the corner of Springfield and West Market. And he's, he, they're going to have a, a rally, or they're going to have a protest, or they're going to be doing something to struggle against somebody who has been uh, 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 abused, uh, someone who has been taken advantage of, uh, someone who's been killed by the police, someone who has been uh, um, uh, forced to leave uh, the United States for one reason or another. Uh, Larry, Larry Hamm and his organization and other organizations that they rally have been working in that capacity. That is the capacity and the foundations of the things that a Malcolm X and a Marcus Garvey had done at the time they did, but, but, but he's been doing this ever since he was 16, right? And so when you think about it that way, many of you are 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. How long do you plan to work, right? How long does the struggle go? And are you dedicated to making the, the commitment that it takes to actually bring about change? See, some, we're in such a quick generation, we want everything to happen tomorrow. But things don't happen that way. You have to be dedicated to what it takes to get there to actually bring about those changes. And when you're dedicated and you push the envelope on things, sometimes they push back. But you have to be willing to stand strong when there's pushback. Larry Hamm stands strong when there's pushback. But the good thing about his standing strong is that, that, that he knows he has other people surrounding him. He has other people who are working in the same vein as he's doing. And that's what you have to do. You have to find people like him who are elder who you're willing to study under. We've got to learn to sit at the feet of our elders so that we can learn how to do the things that we want to do and stop worrying about the glamour and glory. We want the glamour and glory without the hard work. Well, I'm here to tell you that it takes hard work to get to the glamour and glory. And if you really understand the glamour and glory, you don't even worry about that. You're just doing what you're doing, and that kind of happens. And the main thing is about the work that you're doing. Because that's what you're really concerned about anyway, is the work. He was just named by the New York the Newark, uh, Star Ledger as one of the top uh, African Americans in the state of New Jersey. He's number 21 on the list. That's a round of applause for that, I believe. I'm going to put the day Star Ledger, you see that. That's, once again, a testament to his work. He has a whole laundry list of awards and things that he's received. But I think that when you hear what he has to say and the passion that he brings to the table, then it gives you the, the understanding of what to do. And with that said, I'm going to give you Larry Hare. Let's give him a round of applause. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How to the people? How to the people? Um, let me first of all thank Dr. Calfani for uh, inviting me today and give him a big hand for his work here at the college. Uh, first of all, uh, I do want to make reference, since it is today's pleasure, I'm not going to talk a lot about myself or my organization, but you can read about it in today's Star Ledger, page 15, uh, about the People's Organization for Progress. and. As a matter of fact, about an action that we had just Sunday, uh, this past Sunday, February 4th, right across the street 
from the college, how many people know that there is a monument to Rosa Parks right across the street? Yes, a monument to Rosa Parks. It's on uh, 50 West Marketplace. It's not right on the street because you know the parking lot is there, right? It's on the other side of the parking lot in the courtyard in front of the new court building. And Sunday, February the 4th, was the birthday of Rosa Parks, so the People's Organization for Progress. We had a uh, uh, birthday observance at the Rosa Parks Monument. And I'm glad to say that I actually met Rosa Parks. Yes, uh, as Dr. Calfani said, I was a member of the North School Board. I was appointed July 1st, 1971. I was a student at Arts High School, also right up the block, right? I mean, all of this is within like a quarter of a mile radius. I was a student at Arts High School from 1967 to 1971. And in 1971, it was the longest teacher strike in the history of the United States up to that time. And we were in danger of not graduating because if we missed 35 days of school, the law said we weren't supposed to pass to the next grade. So I was the president of student government at Arts High School. I led my first act of civil disobedience as a senior at Arts High School in March of 1971. I took 599 of the 600 students out of Arts High School. We marched out, we marched downtown to the Gateway Hotel, the Hilton Gateway, the same Hilton Gateway that's across the street from Penn Station. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Same, that's where negotiations had taken place, but the negotiations had broke down. So 200 of the almost 600 of us got into the hotel. We took over the sixth and seventh floors of the hotel and we said we weren't gonna leave until the board and the union started their negotiations and resolved their differences and ended the strikes so that we could graduate. Well, I think they sent every fire engine and police car there because remember, just four years earlier, there had been the Newark uprising and I guess they thought there was gonna be another uprising. But as a result of that sitting, I, the mayor of Newark at that time, Ken Gibson, he came and he said that he supported what we were doing, and if we would leave, not get arrested, he would do everything he could to end the strike. And so he seemed like a pretty nice guy. So we believed him, and we withdrew. And about a week later, I'm not saying our city did it, but about a week later, the strike ended. Three months after that, in June of 71, about two weeks before I was gonna graduate from Arts High School, the mayor's aide shows up at my house and says, the mayor wants to know if you would be a member of the Newark Board of Education. I said, a member of the Newark Board of Education? I said, I'm trying to go to college. I'm ready to graduate and go to college. And, but after some discussion, July 1st, 1971, at the age of 17, I became the youngest voting school board member in the history of the United States. I wasn't a student representative on the board. I was one of the nine. And although my own skills and ability may have had something to do with it, the truth of the matter is I owed that appointment to the students that marched out of Arts High School with me, participated in the sit-in, because had that never happened, I would have never met Ken Gibson. You know, too often those of us who rise to some position of authority or power, too often we think that we got there on our own. The truth of the matter is that none of us get there on our own. It's the masses of the people that help carry us into those positions, either by voting or by mass movements or by support, but none of us get there on our own. As a matter of fact, this college wouldn't even be here today had it not been for a mass movement during the 1960s. Essex County College used to be in one little building on Clinton Street. I know because I was in that building. When they wanted to build a new Essex County, they didn't want to put it in Newark. 
But the people rose up and demanded that we have a new facility. And that's why you have Essex County College right here on West Market Street and Martin Luther King Boulevard. It's very important to understand all social progress comes as a result of collective struggle. And we all must learn that lesson here. And I say this to all my brothers and sisters who are professors and te who are teachers here. Remember, before 1965, before the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, the Higher Education Act following that, there were hardly any black professors. So as brilliant as we all are, we would not be in these positions if it wasn't for the nameless people, many people whose names didn't even get into history books. Had it not been for their kicking down the doors of these institutions, we wouldn't have the jobs that we have today. And we must never forget that, brothers and sisters. And I know that's a hard pill for some people to follow because I know you work hard to get your master's and your PhD and everything else, but I'm old enough to remember a term when we hardly had any black teachers, even in the public schools. I went to South 17th Street School from kindergarten to eighth grade. I never had a black teacher. And I came from an all black community. How many of you know what West Side Park is? I grew up at South 12th Street. Was, I went to South 17th Street School, K-8. Didn't have any black teachers. All black neighborhoods didn't have any black teachers at that time. So it's through struggle that collective effort is made. And we have this program here today for Black History Month. People take Black History Month for granted, but there was a time that the thought of the land was that black people didn't even have history, didn't even have a culture. I know you, you read Dr. John Henry Clark, he talks about how when he was a student in high school, he worked for a lawyer and he wanted to take some magazines to his classroom to talk about current events. He wanted to talk about the accomplishments of the Negro. This was back in the beginning of the 20th century. That lawyer told him, he said, John, your people have no history. But the truth of the matter is, you can't tell the history of mankind without telling the history of African people in the United States and in Africa and in the world. The story of mankind, you can't even, it begins in Africa. The story of mankind begins in Africa. All the anthropological evidence, all the earliest remnants of the relations of mankind and modern human beings as we know them, Homo sapiens sapiens, earliest remnants are found throughout Africa. Many of them in East Africa, some of them now in Northern Africa, and all the discoveries keep coming every day. But Black History Month didn't always exist. Where did it came from? How many people know about Carter G. Woodson? How many heard the name Carter G. Woodson? You should read his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, by Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson was the second African American to graduate from Harvard University with a PhD in history. He came from a poor family of coal miners in West Virginia. How he got to Harvard, I don't know. I have to, in the beginning of the 20th century, I can't even figure it out. But suffice it to say that he got to Harvard, he graduated, he got his PhD, and then his PhD was in history, and he wanted to share the fruit of his learning with his people. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, many people still couldn't read. So what did Carter G. Woodson do? Carter G. Woodson started writing a column on Negro history in the black newspaper in Chicago. And what do people do? They took that column, they took it with them to church. And when church service ended, people didn't leave. The person who could read would stand up and read to the congregation that week's column on Negro history that Carter G. Woodson wrote. And this practice evolved into what was then called Negro History Week. And who said Negro History Week? Carter G. Woodson. And when did he set it? He said it in February. A lot of people say, well, why did they put it in February? See, they cheated us. They put it in the shortest month of the year, right? <laughs> no, Carter G. Woodson set it on the second week of February, 
Negro History Week because that two birthdays occur on that week. What are the two? Abraham Lincoln, February 12th, and who? No, on February 14th is the birthday of the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass didn't actually know the date of his own birthday because he was born into slavery. And many slaves' birthdays, that those things weren't recorded. I actually got family records from my family from Virginia, and it had census tracts. Many of us didn't even get last names. George, Mary, that's all. Adult, child, that's what was on the census record. That was on the county courthouse records. So Frederick Douglass chose February 14th as his birthday. And Carter G. Woodson set Negro History Week on that week because he thought those two individuals were the greatest personalities during the greatest conflict in the United States. And what was that conflict? The Civil War. During the Civil War, the Civil War in the United States, nearly a million people were killed. Did you know that? More people were killed in the Civil War. Let me put it this way. More Americans were killed in the Civil War than in World Wars I, World Wars II, Korea, and Vietnam combined. That war was so intense that there were some religious groups in America who actually said that the Civil War was the apocalypse spoken of in the book of Revelation. <laughs> when you read the letters that soldiers, Union soldiers, wrote home to their family members, they said themselves, Mama, I'm standing waist deep in blood, rivers of blood. You know, in some of these battles, like Antietam and Gettysburg, 25,000, 35,000 men would fall in a day. And that was at a time before we had a lot of the weapons that we have now that could kill 25,000 people with one rocket. No, a lot of it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. So Lincoln was the president who prosecuted the Civil War, who carried it through to the end. With all of his flaws, he had flaws and setbacks. But there's one thing you have to say about Lincoln. He saw it through to the end. And Douglas was the greatest advocate for arming black men and putting them into the conflict. Because remember, the Union wasn't winning the war. They weren't winning initially because the will to fight really wasn't that strong. General McClellan held 100,000 men on the Potomac outside of Washington, D.C. He wouldn't fight. Look at Senator Teller, Senator Teller. He wouldn't fight. So Lincoln fired McClellan and hired Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant hired a general to come to William Sherman. And they prosecuted that war. But they still weren't winning. So what did they do? Frederick Douglass and the Radical Republicans and Harriet Tubman and Thaddeus Stevens and others said, Lincoln, you need to arm those who have the greatest interest in winning this war. Lincoln said, wait a minute. Put rifles in the hands of the people we kept in chains. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I think about it. <laughs> so he issues a document. That document is called the Emancipation Proclamation, issued September 22, 1862, becoming effective January 1, 1863. It was a military recruitment document. It didn't free all slaves, but it was an important first step. It offered freedom to those that could escape from their masters, join the Union Army, and if you survive, you will be free. 220,000 black men answered the call. 186,000 in the army, the rest in the other branches of service. That turned the tide of the war. So, Woodson set Negro History Week on that week 
Lincoln's birthday, Douglas' birthday. Negro History Week evolves into Negro History Month. And then once we got an understanding that we weren't colored anymore, and that we were black people, it became Black History Month. Some people say African American History Month. This is important to understand, and in New Jersey, Black History Month is officially observed with the introduction of a resolution by the first black woman senator in the state legislature of New Jersey. Her name was Winona Lippman. I met Winona Lippman. Winona Lippman introduced legislation in 1971, officially recognized, the state of New Jersey officially recognized it. Black History Month, and that is why we have Black History Month. That's the legal process. But the reason why we have Black History Month is because essentially people for centuries have said black people have no history. And this is important to understand. And this, this brings us to why we're here today for Garvey and Nkrumah, and to talk about why Pan-Africanism is still relevant in the 21st century. I want to show you something here today. See, history is all around us, brothers and sisters. History is not dead. You just don't know. See, if you know, history is alive. It's alive every day. Look at this. This is today's daily news. Anybody see this? This. What does it say? Malcolm X name shame. What's the problem? The problem is that there was a young man whose name was Malcolm Xavier Coons. And he goes to high school. And you know in high school, you get a sweater, right? Your varsity, you get a sweater, put your varsity letter on, and you put your name on it, right? He wanted to put his name on his sweater. Malcolm X, his middle name is Xavier. He wanted to put Malcolm X on the sweater. The school administration said, you can't put Malcolm X. Now this is in the 21st century. This is like after civil rights, after black power, after black history. We've been celebrating Black History Month, what, for over 50 years now? If we go to the mid-1960s? X told him that he couldn't have Malcolm X. Now, that's his name. It wasn't even like he's making a political like his name was George and he wanted to put Malcolm <laughs> on this sweater. His name is Malcolm. His, his initial is X. He wanted to put it on his sweater. The administration said, you can't put that on his sweater. There's going to be another walkout. <laughs> but that young man, he's in the paper today. You can read about it. He's fighting it. His parents are fighting it. But this is just one example of why we must have African American studies, black history. We must have, these things must be part of our regular curriculum. Now in the state of New Jersey, almost 10 years ago, the state legislature, a bill sponsored by someone who works right across the street, he used to be an assemblyman, his name is William Payne, and his nephew, who was also an assemblyman, Craig Stanley, they passed a bill called the Amistad Act. And in New Jersey public schools, this means, the Amistad Act means that African American studies must be taught in all courses of study, not just in a separate course. So that all students must be exposed. And this is a, another example. People have a misunderstanding of Malcolm X and who Malcolm X was. And it was Malcolm X that really gave me my first insight into Pan-Africanism. And I know it's difficult for many of you to understand because you have seen the movie Malcolm X and you've seen plays about Malcolm. Like Malcolm is not anything unusual for you, right? But during my time, when I was coming up, people whispered the name of Malcolm X. Like, you would have thought Malcolm X was 12 feet tall, you know, weighed 500 pounds, and would tear the house up, right? Because of the misinformation. But I remember, I used to get Malcolm X records from a store that used to be right across the street. 
on the corner of Springfield Avenue and Martin Luther King Boulevard. There used to be a store there. That's where St. Benedict's Gymnasium is now. There used to be a store there called Ayumba Ya Ujima, the House of Cooperative Economics. That store was owned by a group called the Committee for a Unified Newark, led by a man named Amiri Baraka, who, yes, was the father of the current mayor of Newark, Ross Baraka. And that was the only place in Newark that you could go and actually get a record of one of Malcolm X's speeches. And I got that record. And I was listening to Malcolm, and Malcolm said what? Malcolm said, you can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the tree. You can't hate Africa without hating yourself. How many people remember that quote by Malcolm X? You can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the tree. You can't hate Africa without hating yourself. See, for years, we had been taught that there was nothing about Africa to respect or love. I didn't learn anything, and I, I got what I thought was a good education. But I never learned about Marcus Garvey in elementary school or high school. I never learned about Kwame Nkrumah in elementary school or in high school. I never learned about Carter G. Woodson. I never learned about Booker T. Washington. I never learned about any of these people. More than that, not only did we not learn anything about ourselves, we were taught very negative things about ourselves. And this was reflected not only in the education, but in the culture, in the movies, in the television. You know, uh, uh, we grew up on stuff like Tarzan. I don't know if any of y'all are old enough in here to remember Tarzan, but in Tarzan movies, uh, when I grew up, it was Johnny Weissmuller, he played Tarzan. He was a white man swinging through the jungle. He could beat whole tribes of Africans. If, 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 if he had a problem, he could call on the animals to help him. He could talk. He was like Superman in the jungle. And there was nothing about Africa that we could be proud of. But this was propaganda. This was propaganda. Because the fact of the matter is, Africa made great contributions to civilization. You shouldn't even start teaching black history with slavery. You got to go back to the great civilizations that existed in Africa. They, when I went to school, and, and, and let me know about the time, I don't want to go over time. I went to my daughter's open house night, right? My daughter's uh, in school in, in Montclair. And she gets, this was a, long, a little while ago because they graduated since then. But we had an open house night. I'm listening to the social studies teacher talk about what he's going to teach. Social studies teacher is like really happy, right? Because he knows the black parents are going to like to hear this. He says, I'm going to teach about great African civilization. And you know, everybody's like, yeah, you know, we start clapping. He said, I'm going to talk about Mali. I'm going to talk about some guy. I'm going to talk about Timbuktu. I'm going to talk about great Zimbabwe. And then when we finish with those, when we finish teaching about Africa, then we're going to go to Egypt. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> when you finish, the last time I looked at a map, Egypt was in Africa. Egyptian civilization is African civilization. African people built those pyramids. But to this day in the 21st century, we are still struggling against racism and white supremacy. See, you have to understand, why do we have Pan-Africanism? Why do we have black nationalism? Malcolm X was a black nationalist. Black nationalism is that black people should control the politics, the economics, the social institutions of their community. Why did he say that? Because black people essentially had been robbed of self-determination. When you oppress people, you rob them of their self-determination. And this, this is what happened during the period of enslavement. See, what Pan-Africanism, black nationalism, the desire for black people to control institutions in their own communities, Pan-Africanism is an extension of that because black people all over the world had been denied self-determination. In the process of the explosion of capitalism in the modern era, 
Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the development of capitalism in the modern era. Basically, it starts in Europe, 1400s, 1500s. By the 1600s, by the 1400s, Europeans are already going down the coast of Africa, already beginning in the slave trade. Christopher Columbus was a part of the slave trade. You know, we celebrate Columbus' birthday. Isn't quite ironic because I don't think any of uh, our Hebrew brothers and sisters, our Jewish brothers and sisters, would celebrate any Nazi birthdays, right? Would, would Jewish people celebrate Hitler's birthday? I mean, Christopher Columbus started the slave, started learning the art of navigation through his participation in the Portuguese slave trade down what they call the Guinea Coast. That's where he learned the art of navigation. And when Columbus went on his very first voyages, he took slaves. At that time, it, were, it was not the African. It was the Taino, the Boricua, the Arabic, the Caribbean. These were the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere in the Caribbean and the enslavement of people begins with them. They were the first that were enslaved. But that didn't work out too well because it was their land. They knew where to run and hide. They resisted. The Arabs offered some of the most fierce resistance. And you know, Columbus treated his enslaved people so bad. And, and don't take my word for it. You can Google any of this, right? But read Columbus's own journals. His own journals tell the story. Or you can read books like Eric Williams' Capitalism and Slavery, or Eric Williams from Columbus to Castro. Columbus made the indigenous people, he told them, you got to bring me a thimble full of gold every day, because if you don't, we're going to cut your hands off. And they did. They cut people's hands off, cut people's feet off, cut uh, babies out of the wounds of pregnant women, skinned people alive, it was called flailing. This is what Columbus engaged in. And yet our children are taught to celebrate him. Columbus Day should be a day of mourning for all people of color in the United States. It should be a day of mourning. It should be a day of mourning. Because it is the advent of the era. The period of enslavement is parallel to the development of colonialism, European colonialism, and imperialism. And these are the processes that have impacted on all African peoples, really most people in the third world. And Pan-Africanism is a response to recapture our human development from those processes. Because not only were we enslaved and brought to the Western Hemisphere, but our African brothers and sisters, they were really faced with a form of slavery on the continent. Colonialism really was another form of slavery. And it robbed them of the right of self-determination. A colony was direct rule of the imperial power, the colonial power over those people. Like, they didn't have any government. They had a royal governor appointed by the king, the king of Belgium, uh, the king of uh, England, the king of France, and on and on and on. And so for nearly 400 years, we have colonialism on the African continent. We have colonialism in the Caribbean. We have colonialism. In Latin America, we have enslavement all throughout the Western Hemisphere, first of the indigenous people, and then the Africans, because you know what Bartholomew de las Casas said, right? Because there was a great debate going on about slavery, even before it got really underway. De las Casas says, he was a theologian at his time, and he said, well, we can't enslave the indigenous people because they have souls, but we can enslave the Africans because they have no souls. And you can read about these things in books like Slavery Defended and another volume called Slavery Opposed. All of it, this is all a matter of public record. It's just that it's not taught. And the truth of the matter is we wouldn't need African.
African history, black history, Latin American history, Latino history, Native American history, women's history. We wouldn't need all of these histories if they just taught the truth. Because the truth is all of our contributions to history. And what we've had for all these years is a narrative that bolsters white supremacy, that bolsters racist ideology, with the enslavement of people, the enslavement of the indigenous, and then the enslavement of the Africans, they had to develop an ideology that could, in fact, justify for the inhumane treatment. I mean, there, there was always slavery. There was slavery in Rome. I just saw this movie the other night about the 300, right? About the, the, the 300 that held off, the Spartans held off, you know? They tell us Greek society, democracy. Greece was a slave society. The only people who could vote was just like the people who did voting here in the founding of this country. If you were white, owned property. In Greece, if you were property owned, you could vote. The average working person in Greece couldn't vote. And they had a whole class of people that were slaves. In Sparta, they were called the hoplites. That much they had right in them. But these were slave societies, but there was never a slavery like this, like the commodification of human beings, the packing of people on slave ships, on voyages that could last 90 days. Eric Williams says in Capitalism and Slavery that a dead man in a coffin had more room than a slave on a slave ship. And then when we were brought here, our people were stripped of all of their indigenous culture. Our names, our culture, they even outlawed the drum. Our families torn apart, our people branded like cattle. This, and this thing of branding, you know, it wasn't just that they brand, like if you ran away, they would brand an R in your forehead so that everybody would know you were a runaway. This was inhumane. This was like something that had never existed before. But you know why they did it? It was a money maker. Money. By 1860, the greatest form of capital in the United States, greater than industrial capital and banking capital combined, was the money invested in the institution of slavery. This is why it took a civil war to end it, because people were making money, and they didn't want to stop making money off black bodies. So this pan-Africanism evolves out of our desire to connect back to Africa. Garvey wasn't the first pan-Africanist. Garvey learned much of what he learned from Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington, you know, he gets a bad rap because he was an accommodationist, you know, to a degree. But many people don't know Booker T. Washington was funding projects in Africa. When CK and his crew took over the slave ship and defeated their slavers on the Amistad, they wanted to go back to Africa. How many know where the Star Ledger building is down here on uh, Washington Street? <sighs> Well, let me back up a little bit. How many of y'all know where the New Jersey pack is? There's a, there's a monument on the plaza out at New Jersey pack. You've seen it. It looks like an arch, not attached to any building. And it's got a glass in there. And on that glass are the names. You know what their names are? People that were buried where New Jersey pack is now. When they started burying well, I mean, excuse me, when they started building New Jersey Pack, the People's Organization for Progress stopped the construction. Why? Because they were digging up a cemetery of where Africans and Native Americans have been buried. And according to federal law, you can't just keep working. There's a whole procedure you got to go through to reinter those bones. That was an African burial ground. And if you look at that monument, you'll see a name on there, Cujo, Jack Cujo. He was an African from here. And when the American Revolution broke out, you know, the, the Americans, they were in trouble. They were in so much trouble 
that they had to enlist black men into the Revolutionary Army because the British were winning. By the way, the British enlisted blacks in their army too. They promised the black people, yes, you have freedom if you fight for us. But Jack Cujo fought for the American, Revo American Revolutionary Army. He distinguished himself. Where the Star Ledger building is now is that great building on Court and Washington and University. That used to be Jack Cujo's farm. When the American Revolution was over, Washington gave Cujo his freedom and life. Thousands of black men fought for the American Revolutionary Army at that time. But we were always striving to get back to Africa, to support Africa. And in the 19th century, this reaches a crescendo. And Booker T. Washington and others start talking about the need to establish that link. Garvey comes along in the 1920s. How many know? How many people know seeing the red, black, and green flag? Yeah. The red, black, and green, always see black people in the red, black, and green. That is the flag of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, adopted as the official flag of that body at their convention in Madison Square Garden in, I think, 1926. That was Garvey's flag. And people over the years have adopted it and it's kind of become black people's flag because African Americans as such, because we can't connect with a particular country in Africa, we connect with all of Africa. And that was a flag of Garvey. That was a flag of the UNIA. But I first came to this idea of Pan-Africanism that because black people were victims of enslavement, because Black people, when I say black, I'm not just talking about the people here in the US, I'm talking about throughout the world because we were the victims of colonialism, because we are the ongoing victims of imperialism through neocolonialism, because in many of these places, there were liberation wars that were fought and colonial masters were thrown out and we established governments were soon those governments became puppets of the very powers that we had overthrown. When I was a college student at Princeton University, we were struggling to help the people in South Africa, the people in Southern Africa. We formed an organization on our campus called the People's Front for the Liberation of Southern Africa. We wanted Princeton to divest its funds from companies doing business with South Africa. We took over Nassau Hall, the university administration building, and a national monument because the provisional revolutionary government of America was established at Nassau Hall in 17 something. We took that over for three days and Princeton divested from several corporations doing business with South Africa because of the student movement there. But this was a movement that has swept the world. So we always was struggling to support the struggles because there was an understanding that if Africa was strong, we would be strong. Just like when I was a kid, there used to be a saying called, you ain't got a Chinaman's chance. Any of y'all ever heard that? You don't have a Chinaman's chance. When I was a kid, if you had something made in China, people would laugh at you. Made in Taiwan, people would laugh at you. People not laughing about China no more. China is going to be the number one economy in the world in a few years, not in some long time from now, in a few years. It's going to be the number one economy. And with China, even though I know a lot of people say, well, it's a communist country, but don't think that the Chinese don't have a lot more respect because of the strength of China today. And that was Kwame Nkrumah's dream. In his book, Africa Must Unite, he talked about a United States of Africa. Is that right, Kwame? Yes, sir. A United States of Africa to bring together the one billion people. And that's why in the 1960s they formed the Organization of African American Unity as a prelude. But that didn't work out so well, and then they reformed it again. It's called the African Union today. And this is why Malcolm X, before he was assassinated, formed an organization called the Organization of Afro-American Unity because he wanted to connect the brothers and sisters in the diaspora, that's everywhere outside of Africa, to 
that movement within Africa. And this struggle goes on, brothers and sisters. Pan-Africans, and as long as we have imperialism, as long as we have neo-colonialism, in most places we don't have colonialism anymore, we have neo-colonialism. As long as we have racism and white supremacy, black nationalism, pan-Africanism, will always have currency because they are ideologies that help people seek to be established self-determination over themselves, over their communities, and over their nations. I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. And I'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Take some questions. Yes. You mentioned China. I've heard China brought up a lot of land in Africa. Yes. Is that true? Yes, it is true. Not only land, they bought mines of different types, uh, gold, silver, so on. They're buying water in China. China has a billion people. It's like an organism that's going to constantly need. And so they're going all over the world. They've done a lot in Africa. They've been in, they, they didn't just get to Africa. In the period of the anti-colonial struggles, when Tanzania first got its independence in the early 60s, China went into Tanzania and helped build the Tanzan Railroad a railroad that runs through Tanzania and Zambia. So China's presence is not new, but it has been stepped up as China has advanced economically. And a lot of people have concerns about this. I'm not going to pass judgment and say it's great. I'm not going to pass judgment and say it's not great. But I'll tell you this, a lot of people have concerns because African people do not have control over African resources. Everybody got a cell phone? You know what's in your cell phone? Coltan. You know where they get coltan from? Congo. You know who digs it up? Little 12 year old, 8 year old children. You know how much they're paid? Almost nothing. So the super exploitation of Africa is going on. And it affects you in your, every time you use a cell phone, think about it, there's something from Africa in that cell phone. <laughs> but the African people are not receiving the benefit. This is the nature of imperialism. Imperialism constantly seeks new markets of cheap labor and constantly seeks resources to commodify to sell in the market. Another question. Yes. Um, uh, in terms of ideology, um, whose who's ideology were you more prone to? Martin Luther King's integration of black people in American society or um, Malcolm X? Okay. That is a false dichotomy, first of all. That's a false dichotomy. It's a, it's a dichotomy, I think, that's perpetuated by a number of folks. I ain't going to name no names. But Believe me, first of all, let me say this. Everyone in here who loves Malcolm X, you need to read Malcolm X. And, and I'm not talking about the autobiography. All praises do to brother that wrote the autobiography. I'm not putting the autobiography down. But if you want to know about Malcolm, read what Malcolm said. Malcolm X speaks. Everybody should read that. From cover to cover. I'm not talking about read 10 pages. Get the book, read a few pages a day, don't try to read it all in one night. Read a little bit at a time until you read the whole book. Malcolm X Speaks. Malcolm X, this is the title of a book, by any means necessary, it's more speeches by Malcolm X. Malcolm X on Afro-American history. These are the speeches, this is what Malcolm said. And too many times we go on other people's interpretation of Malcolm and not on what Malcolm said. And I'm telling you, when you start reading Malcolm, and remember, Malcolm was evolving. There's a period of Malcolm when he's with the Nation of Islam, so he's saying one thing. There's a period of Malcolm when he had just uh, broke with the Nation of Islam. He formed the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. He was saying something else. And then there's a period of Malcolm at the end where Malcolm forms the OAAU, where Malcolm is just saying something that's totally different from what Malcolm in many ways, not totally, but in many ways different 
from what, what, what Malcolm was saying in 1959 and 1960. Secondly, you need to read Martin Luther King. It's not enough to have a holiday with statues, streets, and schools named after Dr. King. Dr. King wrote six books. Here they are. Measure of a Man, Stride Toward Freedom, Why We Can't Wait, excuse me, yes, Why We Can't Wait, Strength to Love, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, and Trumpet of Conscience. Of those six, I think the most important is Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. Everybody should try to read that book cover to cover. And if you can't get all those books, get the best of all, A Testament of Hope. It's a collection of, of Dr. Burke, Dr. King's works edited by Dr. James Washington. An entire third of that book are the speeches, articles, sermons that Dr. King gave in the last 18 months of his life. And I'm telling you, when you read Chaos of Community and you read the last speeches that Dr. King gave in 67 and in 68, you won't be able to tell Malcolm X from Martin Luther King because they were both struggling. See, Dr. King was struggling to abolish American apartheid. That's what people call integration. When they talk about the integration version, when Malcolm was with the Nation of Islam, they were talking about separating and establishing a separate country, a country within a country like the five states in the black belt, something like that. Um, Dr. King was trying to abolish all of those laws that said, well, you can't live in the West Ward of Newark. I mean, we had red lines. Black people couldn't buy a house up there. I know, because I live in Newark most of my life. So they say integration, it's, it's a false dichotomy. It's, it's not Malcolm or Martin, it's Malcolm and Martin, both. Someone else had a question. Yeah, young lady right here. Question. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Let's give her a mic. She was shy. I was going to ask that, you know, like you said that they think um, people from each other is not considered in Africa. Right. I was going to say that they, is it that call uh, Southern-centrism? Because, like, they think Africa is over the top, which is that they have nothing to do with it. Right. Through the colonization. Right. Right. So, so she's, she's asking a question about a, 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 a point that's raised in our class, she's in our intro sociology class, she's raised the question about xenocentrism. Right. And maybe just for everybody here, what is xenocentrism? Xenocentrism is the belief that what is wrong is that, that our own lifestyle, products, or ideas are inferior to those of others. Okay, all right. So the question is, is there a question of that statement? That statement, okay. Is there another question? Yes. How you doing, sir? Thank you yes. for being here. Uh, what can you tell, what advice can you give to our students here today living under a government that is clearly xenophobic, racist, and perpetuating hate? Right. What advice can you give to our young students here, of all the students of all ages here today? The students who are all here today, regardless of who you are, you need to get together and build a student movement to totally transform this country. That's what we need. Starting with tr getting the current government out. <laughs> this is Washington, D.C. Get them out. I mean, how, how, how does... Right, right. Uh, I'm tempted to talk about two things at once, but I'm going to <laughs> um, let, let me just say quickly, students need to be engaging in massive voter registration. Massive voter registration. Every student at Essex County College needs to be registered. Everybody needs to vote this year in the congressional elections, next year in the municipal and local elections, and the year after that. If, if Trump is not impeached in 2020, we got to vote him out in 2020. Him and the whole regime. Because it's not just Trump. It's a whole regime. It's those who control the House, those who control the Senate. Uh, they all have to go. But, but we need a student. Let me just say quickly, one of the things that our organization, People's Organization for Progress, 
is working on right now, People's Organization for Progress is a grassroots organization. We work for racial, social, economic justice, and peace. We're a multi-issue organization. One of the issues we're working on is this. We believe that college education in the United States should be free. Should be free tuition, no tuition at any college. Number two, we call for an immediate end to all student debt. All student loans need to be forgiven. They can bail out the banks. They shouldn't be making you try to pay back thousands of dollars for your education. On April the 21st, Saturday, April 21st, we're going to have a march for free college, no student debt. We're going to start right across the street at the Lincoln Monument, and we're going to march to downtown North. It'll be the first march for free college education in the state of New Jersey ever. So I'm hoping, yes, I'm hoping that we can get the support here. If you right across the street, <laughs> All the students at Essex County College need to be at that march. So if you want to uh, work on this with us, give me your contact information before you leave, and I'll reach back out to you. Our organization, we meet every Thursday. We're meeting tonight. Thursday, we meet every Thursday at the Abyssinian Baptist Church, 224 West Kenny Street in York. We meet every Thursday at 630. Our meetings are open to the public. You're all invited. We're going to be talking about the march tonight at our meeting and every Thursday until April the 21st. But, you know, you guys should not be graduating with twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of loans by the time you're senior. That, that, that puts you at a total disadvantage. If you gotta pay the bank back $1,000 a month, that almost defeats the purpose of going to college. I have three daughters. I put all three through college. I had to mortgage my house twice and sell my house the third time. My last daughter, she's, she's at Rutgers now, she's a senior. People shouldn't have to mortgage their homes and sell their homes to get their kids through college. That's crazy. We're the only advanced industrial country that does that. I'm, I'm not even talking about communism and socialism. I'm talking about Germany, France, Japan, these other capitalist countries. They don't put that kind of burden on their students. You know, we shouldn't put that burden on our students here. So I hope that you'll work with us on this march. Any other questions before we get out of here? Going once. Yes? Um, do you believe the assassination of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X is the reason for the lack of uh, a lot of black Jews in today? I think the movement would look different if Dr. King had not been assassinated and Malcolm X assassinated. You know, the anniversary of Malcolm X assassination is this month. Malcolm X was assassinated February 21st, 1965. And we're going to be doing something at our meeting tonight. That's a Thursday night, but February 21st, 1965. Dr. King was assassinated April 4th, 1968. This year is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. So I hope y'all will be doing something at Essex County College because you are out of school on Dr. King's birthday, right? School's not back in session, but you'll be in school uh, April 4th. So I hope you'll do something here April 4th to commemorate the assassination of Dr. King. There was an FBI program called COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO, Counterintelligence Program. That program had targeted Malcolm X and had targeted Dr. King and targeted a bunch of other people including Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Torre, a bunch of, but Dick Gregory, a bunch of people. And that's one of the reasons why we have such a hard time building the kind of movement we need to build. We need a movement in this country, brothers and sisters. We need a movement, a movement to transform the whole thing. That's what Dr. King was talking about. That's what uh, Malcolm X was talking about. That's what Kwame Nkrumah was talking about. You read his last, if you read neo-colonialism, the last age materialism, you'd be like, what? <laughs> and is that it? Any other questions? That's about it. That's about it. Thank you very much. How are you? I know you have to be ready. Let's give a round of applause for Larry and Larry. I hope you learned a little something here with them. And uh, I want to thank you very much, uh, Brother Ham, for coming out and talking with the students, with the community. And I think that one of the last things he said is the most powerful, most powerful portion, and that is that what are you going to do? 
right? It's great to come to lectures like this. It's great to, uh, uh, to, to read books. But if you have got to do something, if you really want change in the world in which you live, the people who you admire are the people who did something. So you have to figure out what it is that you're going to do to bring about change. What are you going to do different tomorrow than you did today? Thank you. And if you want to come in here and have a list up here, if you want to get uh, more information from, uh, from Larry, please come and put your name on the list. It's already up here on the table. Um, and uh, thank you for all of you coming out. Have a good afternoon.